and welcome to the program. And yes, there really is every wind of doctrine going on today. Unfortunately, it lands in our churches, well, on a daily basis, quite frankly. And uh, let me just kind of set the stage here for the hour, because I recently shared a prophecy conference platform with Pastor Barry Stagner. This was in Toronto, Canada, back on May 11th, as well as Jack Hibbs, Amir Sarfati, and myself, and Amir's organization planned the Canadian Canadian event had over 2,000 in attendance from around the world. You can order DVDs at BeholdIsrael.org, BeholdIsrael.org. And I was drawn in particular to Pastor Barry Stagner's message because it was on deception in the church that day. So I asked him if he would be willing to join me on Understanding the Times Radio. And Barry is a pastor of Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. I also was privileged to participate in his proximity conference back on January 5th of this year in California. Here's where we're kind of going in this hour, because he and I believe that the same generation that saw the rebirth of the nation of Israel would also see a radical shift in thinking and beliefs within the church. All right, that's been now over 70 years. So a lot has happened in the world and the church in those 70, 71 years. And if deception is to be the pitfall that will characterize the church of the last days, and it is, how will those living therein be able to withstand the looming tide of deceit that is rising with every passing day? As a matter of fact, too often those that are being deceived are totally unaware that the wool has been pulled over their eyes. And I'm just going to give a couple of verses here to substantiate sort of the climate that's going on in the church today, because the Bible predicted it over and over again. Second Timothy 4, we read, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Acts 20, verse 29, Know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even your own number men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. 1 John 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, context frequently, folks, is latter days, latter times. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. One more verse, Matthew 7, 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And then the verse that I already referenced, Ephesians 4, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. So, Pastor Barry Stagner, for the first time, welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Thank you, Jan. It's a great privilege to be on with you. You know, Paul says, latter times, spiritual discernment will be so low in much of the church that the doctrines of demons will not just be unrecognized, but they'll be taught, they'll be defended, they'll be promoted as valid. And this would be all out of the church of Laodicea, the last age of the church, which we are in. Tell me, when did you start to notice? I'm going to give my perspective later, but when did you start to notice these things beginning to happen? Well, I think one of the early tells, so to speak, regarding this move or shift in thinking was when we started using terms that were common to marketing organizations. Yes. We started talking about branding and things along those lines. And again, I'm not uh, one who is real big or controlled by verbiage, so to speak. But when you start to incorporate things beyond the language and the practices, I think that's when we really began to see that there was a shift and that the church, rather than having confidence in the gospel message and the fact that God said no one comes unless he draws, began to become tactical in their approach in that things that were working in the world to fill arenas and theaters were Mm -hmm. being employed within the church. To me, that was really the first indication that there was a significant paradigm shift. Yeah. 
And I would agree with you, and I want to go back to that in just a minute, exactly what you just talked about. I want to give a verse here, and this is a verse you highlighted in your message. It happened to be Second Timothy 4, and for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, in your message, you clarified a little bit. This is your message back in mid-May. You clarify what you feel some of the fables of today's church would be. Well, I think it's important to point out the difference in a myth and a fable. One of the distinctions is a myth is something that is completely fabricated, and I think I gave the example of the flying horse Pegasus. If we look at a fable, a fable incorporates actual realities. You would hear about uh, an old woman who lived in a shoe with more children than she knew what to do with. These are all things that we would be familiar with. Old women exist today, shoes exist, children exist, all those things. And this is what is happening, I think, in the church, that there is language being used that is familiar, sounds very churchy, but the vocabulary has a different dictionary, and there's a different set of meanings behind things. And I think that's a lot of uh, what we're seeing and experiencing in the church today, that things are being said that sound churchy, sound religious, but they're actually not true. We've talked about many of those things in the message that are happening today. But again, I think just this practice in and of itself is what started the whole process in the downhill slide was just changing the basic narrative of the church, yet keeping similar or spiritual sounding language. Yeah. And I want to talk with you a little bit about a seeker sensitive. And actually, that's one of the things you kind of focused on in that message. And whether we want to call some of the things that are going on in the mega church movement, we can call it that mega church movement. You can call it church growth movement. You can call it seeker sensitive movement. You call it purpose driven movement. It's kind of all one and the same. It's the marketing, which you've already referenced, which I think is huge. I think that came along in about the 1990s. I just want to throw in a few other things that I've seen. And I think I started seeing seeing the changes, Barry Stagner, and Barry Stagner is my guest for the hour. I think I started seeing them probably in about the 1990s, maybe the late 1980s, and I hear some of the things I saw. The evangelical outfits began to focus just as much on the green agenda as the evangelistic agenda. Another bullet point, social justice became the new mantra. Another bullet point, the religious left picked up steam, and the conservatives moved over to the religious left. Another point I saw, eschatology, of course, dropped. It was not going to fill the pews or the the offering plates and younger people had no interest in the topic. Again, that kind of goes back to church growth. Another thing I saw happen in about the 1990s, church music changed. Some of the lyrics became unsound, improper. Again, I want to dwell for a minute on Secret Sensitive, but we had Bill Hybels. He introduced the Secret Sensitive movement to attract numbers. He admitted some 25 years later. Folks, it didn't work. Just a couple of other things I, I began to notice. Well, the evangelical love for Israel began to diminish, and this was certainly in the last 10 years. Uh, the denigration and mocking, again, of Bible prophecy went into overdrive, the denigration and mocking of pre-tribulation rapture of the church in the last 10 years into overdrive. Health and wealth movement took off 1990s, heavily spurred on by outfits such as Trinity Broadcasting Network. All of this and more seemed to signal to me that we were in the times of the Church of Laodicea. I probably missed some things there, Barry, but those are some of the primary bullet points I saw starting somewhere in the 1990s. Well, Jan, I think probably the first mistake of the seeker movement was asking the world what they wanted yes. out of the church. And this is something that isn't any big mystery that's been unveiled, like from the National Enquirer or something. Yeah. This is how the seeker movement has presented itself. We went to the neighborhoods, we asked the people what kept them from coming to church, and basically their reply was, well, church is too churchy. Mm -hmm. The church decided, well, we'll take away the things you don't like, will you come then? It, it was almost the old bait-and-switch maneuver that you would see with a slippery salesman that will offer one thing and then sell you another when you get to the office. That's kind of the mentality behind this, that we're going to make sure that you're comfortable with our yep. setting, that there's nothing too authoritarian, like a pulpit or a cross, or exclusive that eliminates the belief in other religious systems. And it's just going to be a welcoming place where you're going to be entertained by the music, and then later, maybe in a small setting, we can slip in the gospel and hopefully some will be saved. I mean, this is how they packaged their own tactical adjustments because their numbers were diminishing yeah. in church attendance. So there had to be a strategy involved. And it was basically, let's go knock door to door and not share the four spiritual laws, but find out what it is we can do to get people to come to church. Right. And Jan, you know, one of the things that 
created part of the problem is one of the common terms associated with this movement, and that is reaching the unchurched, because the lost or the unsaved or non-believers are too aggressive of terms. So basically the shift was and to call them the unchurched. Now, the main problem I see with that word myself is that it implies that getting churched is the solution to your dilemma, when the fact is people don't need to get churched, people need to get saved. Yeah. I think we need to keep our language and our vernacular as believers intact because it's been responsible for the rescuing of souls for nearly two millennia. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell here. I have on the line from California, Pastor Barry Stagner, Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. You can learn more at cctustin.org. That's Calvary Chapel, Calvary, cctustin.org. I want to play a clip of Andy Stanley, Barry, and it's how to engage unbelievers, because Andy Stanley is going to say here, we are seeker focused. And then I want to follow that up with a question. What drove us wasn't so much about changing church as it was trying to figure out how we could engage unchurched people and unbelievers in our community in the local church. We were actually told that it wouldn't work. We were told that it wouldn't work because we were in the South and there's a church on every corner and the last thing Atlanta, Georgia needed was another church. And we completely agreed, in fact, when we stood up in front of our first group of people on our launch night, I said, Atlanta doesn't need another church. But what Atlanta, Georgia needs is a different kind of church, a church where people feel free to invite their unchurched friends and family members. So that was the beginning of the journey for us. And we've been very successful in terms of counting people in numerically. And I think part of the reason was when we started, nobody else was doing this in our community. We set out to be seeker focused. That is, our, the bottom line for us was to create a church that unchurched people loved to attend. Not simply a church that it was easy to invite someone to. We wanted to create environments, church environments, that unchurched people absolutely love to attend. The thing we celebrate, it's not just salvation, it's bigger than that. It's unchurched people finding our church, finding their way in, navigating the complexity, and becoming followers of Jesus Christ. The people that God is most interested in on Sunday morning are the ones that are driving up and down this street and don't even know we're here. It's not about me, and it's not about you. So when somebody comes to me and says, Dan, I really don't like the music, I say to them, I need to apologize to you. I somehow have given you the impression that church is for you. And I don't know what I have done to give you that impression. But, but I really want you to hear, it's not. And, and I know the music's a stretch for you. It's a stretch for me. But we're not here for the already convinced. We're here for the yet-to-know Christ crowd. And, and, and we've got to fish with the bait that they understand. So I hope that you can buy in to purpose over preference. Do you hear that phrase? Choose purpose over preference. Okay, Barry Stagner, I thought church was about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, but I'm hearing from those who want to push this more market-driven, seeker-sensitive, church growth, etc. It's not about the Christian. And as you and I intro and talked in the early part of the hour here, it seems to be about the seeker. And it's interesting, Jan, because we have come to a place within the church where Spiritual accuracy is basically measured by attendance in the mind of a lot of people. But I think what we need to recognize is that there can be large attendance, but a small church. The church is comprised of people who have been born again by the Spirit of the true and living God through the preaching of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And what the seeker movement seems to have concluded is that that model doesn't work anymore. And therefore, there needs to be more tactics to get people into the church. Basically, as one of the clips stated, the fact that there's a lot of people coming here shows that we are indeed successful in our endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I don't disagree with that. They are successful in their endeavor. It's the Lord who adds to the church daily those being saved, not those who are comfortable in a setting that they're familiar with because there's nothing too churchy in it. Well, you said in this particular message, and again, I'm referring to the message my guest, Pastor Barry Stagner, gave at our conference in Toronto, Canada. This is back on May the 11th prophecy conference that we gave. You said we live in an age where secular songs are played in church to make the seeker feel more comfortable. We live in an age where
where crosses and pulpits have been removed because some see them as authoritarian and representing all that keeps people from coming to church. And you already referenced that. And then you said many churches are designed more like a nightclub than a house of worship, again, in an effort to make visitors more comfortable. The problem is that by design, the church is not supposed to be anything like the world. I want to just play one more clip here in this early part of our programming. And it's Bill Hyples who really came up with this idea some 25, 30 years ago. And here he's saying a real short clip, it didn't work. So Greg Hawkins, again, just brilliant guy. He goes, Bill, we've made a mistake. What we should have done at about this point, when people cross the line of faith, become Christians, we should have started telling people and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self feeders. We should have gotten people we should have gotten people, taught them how to read their Bible between services, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. The church growth principles utilize the wisdom of the world for its foundation rather than Christ. Paul specifically warned of the dangers of building the church upon foundations other than Jesus. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's Stagner, so this brilliant idea mm, didn't work so well. No, and I think we're reaping that. Yeah, uh, we're reaping the it. Church because we've got guys who have followed that model. I heard one pastor say that he has never used the word sanctification in any sermon. Okay. He followed that with, I've taught the principle, but Jan, the word's in the scripture. And it's what the Lord desires for us is that we would be sanctified. And again, just taking this whole approach in trying to be the church without sounding churchy, mm-hmm. without using or speaking Christianese. And I do think we need to understand that there is a way for us to approach the non-believer and to share with them the gospel. But once they have heard the gospel, once they have made their decision to follow Christ, then as you mentioned at the top of the show, the church has a responsibility, according to Paul in Ephesians 4, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The ministry that the church has is going to the world, preaching the gospel, while we are meeting the needs of the society around us, as Paul told Titus, make sure you're meeting urgent needs. So it's not that there isn't a responsibility to the church to care for the pressing things going on around them, but our primary responsibility, again, is simply put in Mark 16, 15 and Matthew 28, 19, to go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jan, as I said in the message, I don't think that the church should be playing stairway to heaven in the sanctuary. I think the church needs to be warning about the highway to hell, telling people how they can avoid spending their eternity separated from God, which really is the heart of the gospel. Right. Perhaps you as well, Barry Stagner, but the most common email that comes into this ministry and into me personally, and as I do travel a little bit anyway and meet the folks and various conferences you and I share at, they come up to me pretty sad-eyed and say, you know, I can't find a church or I've visited every potential church church in my town and for various reasons, and I listed some of those in my bullet points, one of them being they'd love to hear eschatology touched on at least a couple of times a year minimum, and of course that's probably not going to happen. That's not really the focus of this hour, but nonetheless that's just one of the many issues that's breaking the heart. But it seems to me the church is all about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, but it's kind of gone into this other direction that's very, very troubling. And again, that one of the founders said, we tried this, we tried tried it for 25 years, 30 years, just didn't work. We found out our people were not growing. They weren't reading their Bibles, etc. And I know Bill Hybel stepped down really almost in disgrace over other issues, but I give him credit for at least coming forth and saying what we tried for several decades, it was a failure. I think, Jan, that's a good point because a lot of the times when a model doesn't work, the sheep are blamed. And we see a lot of that in the word faith movement. Well, if you didn't get healed, if you're not wealthy, uh, you don't have enough faith. And it's kind of that transference or deflection because of the emptiness of the message. In looking at this, Jan, and what you just said is so crucially important. What Heibel said himself, they hadn't become self-feeders. And I think all of us recognize that we often see the word presented metaphorically as the bread of life and that it is our sustenance and we are to feed on the word and meditate on it day and night. 
when you've got something that is simply packaged to make people have an experience within a room called a sanctuary and not creating within them a hunger and thirst for righteousness, which obviously we gain as the Lord imputes righteousness to us, but we also need to employ the practical side of that by finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and becoming living sacrifices and proof of what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. You know, again, I agree with you. I think that is the right perspective, but it's not limited to that particular movement that how the model didn't work. The plan of God is quite simple, and Jesus laid it out directly in Acts 1.8, where he reminded us that the purpose of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So you can't change perfection. I mean, the model that the Lord has presented, which later in Acts we're told, and the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. So that tells us that God expects people to get saved during the week, not just on Sunday in the sanctuary. And that's the work of the ministry that the church needs to be equipped to do. One more clip here on this topic. It happens to be Mark Driscoll. And again, we're still in this particular topic here of a church growth movement. It goes by so many names, folks. Seeker-sensitive, purpose-driven, just goes by lots of different names. But this Mark Driscoll, I found, I mean, it's a very, very sad clip. Let's play, and then let me ask you about it when we finish. Here's what I've learned. You cast vision for your mission, and if people don't sign up, you move on. There are people that are going to die in the wilderness, and there are people that are going to take the hill. That's just how it is. Too many guys waste too much time trying to move stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate people. I am all about blessed subtraction. There, there is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. <laughs> and by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. You either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options. But the bus ain't going to stop. I'm just a guy who is like, look, we love you, but this is what we're doing. There's a few kind of people. There's people who get in the way of the bus. they got to get run over. There are people who want to take turns driving the bus. they got to get thrown off. <laughs> because they want to go somewhere else. There are people who will be on the bus, leaders and helpers and servants, they're awesome. There's also just sometimes nice people who sit on the bus and shut up. They're not helping or hurting, just let them ride along. And Barry Stanger, here's the thing with that clip that I just played. It was Mark Driscoll. And this is the feedback I get in the emails that come to me. Folks go to their pastor and they say, you know, can we maybe do things a little bit differently here? And the response is, you know what? If you don't like it, there's the door. Pastors do that, not uh, care. They do not care. The left foot of fellowship. The left foot of fellowship. And, you know, what he said, uh, I think, initially was in within the first few words, he said, if there are those who don't get in line with your mission. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the problem right there. We don't have a mission. God has a mission, and he has called some as pastors and teachers to do what Paul said in Ephesians, and that is to equip the saints. And to say, you know, hey, people are either on your team or throw them off the team or throw them off the bus or run them over with the bus. Yeah, run them over. Yeah, my first thought was too many people spend time trying to direct or change the minds of stiff-necked people, and they need to just get over that and just run them over. Some guy named Moses comes to mind uh, dealing with a group of stiff-necked people, and it seems as though he was so passionate about these people that he was concerned about them and asked the Lord, hey, you know, rather than destroy them, just deal with me. The Lord was going to destroy those people, and Moses intervened for him. So where you come up with such an attitude is certainly not within the pages of Scripture as a pastor. And, you know, there's always going to be people issues within the church, but Jesus already knew that. (laughs) And there's room for various personalities, and there's room for input as to how different things. I love when people come with ideas. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like to tell people when they say, hey, why don't we do this? I just say, that sounds good. You're in charge. That's what the work of ministry is all about. When somebody comes in and says, you know, hey, why don't you do this? I think there's room to encourage them to get involved themselves. You know, just this kind of, hey, listen, I'm the big guy. If you don't like the way I do things, take a hike. I just can't find that in Scripture, Jen. That's somewhere in the book of Second Opinions, I think, rather than uh, in Scripture. Well, I think the positive takeaway from your message that you gave, and that is this, that in the latter times when apostasy is in full swing and the doctrines of demons are preferred over sound doctrine, in other words, your point was Jesus is coming soon. The Laodicean church represents the end of the church age, and clearly we're in the end of the church age. We're going to 
pick up on this, folks, when I get back from a real quick break here in the midpoint of my programming, because I don't want to let this point go. The Bible keeps saying that it's going to be the last days when every wind of doctrine is going to be so prominent. And we're in those days. That's the good news. Back in just a minute. If this programming strikes a chord with you, let us hear from you. You can always write us through a website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time at 763-559-4444, at 763-559-4444. We are available by mail by writing Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Write to Jan Markell and Olive Tree Ministries at Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. More with Jan and Pastor Barry Stagner in a moment. It is now on the horizon. Understanding the Times 2019, Saturday, September 21st. Tickets will go on sale June 1st. They are general admission only and are $25, but include a lunch. After June 1st, we're asking that you call the Brush Fire Agency at 888-338-5338 or sign up online at brushfire.com. That number again is 888-338-5338 after June 1st. We're featuring six speakers and we begin at 8.45 a.m. Church doors open at 7 a.m. And the location is again Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. Consult our website for hotel information. Our speakers include Dr. Robert Jeffress. These signs that have been around for a long time, they are increasing in frequency and intensity. I think something big's about to happen. Yeah, I believe I we're too. in the last days. I believe the Lord is going to return. Amir Sarfati. And at the last trumpet, we're gonna be out of here. There will be certain events around the world and there will be the last trumpet and we don't know the day and we don't know the hour, but we understand the times and the seasons. Pastor J.D. Farag. Because there's coming a time and I believe it's very soon when that trumpet's gonna sound and everything here matters no more. I mean, shouldn't that affect us the way we live our lives? Pastor Jack Hibbs. And he's not only spoken to us in his word, he is speaking to us right now in world events. He's requiring you and I to take what we're seeing in the world and match it up against the Word of God. And Jan Markell. I believe that the world is longing for a man with a plan, for a Mr. Fix-It. It says down at the bottom of here, is there a leader who can stop the chaos? We will also have a greeting from Lori Cardoza Moore from Proclaiming Justice to the Nations. The event will be live streamed at no cost. Again, that's Saturday, September 21, just outside of Minneapolis. We invite all remnant believers to better understand the times and become watchmen on the wall. Make friends for life at this annual conference. Learn why things aren't falling apart, they are falling into place. not have indications in scripture where there's going to be a second group of apostles spanning some 2,000 years between the last group that was anointed and appointed by Jesus. There's nothing in scripture that says such a group is going to arise in the last days. We know you lead busy lives, so if you miss a portion of our radio program, catch us online. You can both watch and listen to programming on our YouTube channel under Jan Markell where we slip in images related to our discussion. The program is also posted to our website and to oneplace.com on Saturday morning of each week. You can download the One Place mobile app and play the programming on your phone and other devices as well. Let's return to Jan Markell and Pastor Barry Stagner. Jesus made this very, very clear. Wolves would enter in who would twist the gospel of the kingdom and use it to bait and allure God's people away from the truth to destroy them. So preachers are not just to accurately preach the gospel, they're also to aggressively and bravely defend the accurate preaching of the gospel. And the only way to really do that is by exposing lies. So in this movie, our intent is to do both. Number one, to present the truth, and number two, in order to make sure that the truth is clearly represented to also expose the lies that lead people away from the truth. Part of loving people is being willing to tell them the truth even when it's not welcome or even when it's not popular. 
part of sharing truth obviously requires a willingness to expose deceptions. Now some people have come to us and said, hey, why are you making this movie now? Well, here's why. There are certain denominations that we've all sort of given up on. Giant Christian organizations that we all trusted and loved, that we've all been very thankful for in past years, are, are suddenly beginning to show signs that they're caving and surrendering to cultural pressures. And many of you, many who will watch this movie in fact, still think that those institutions are safe and they're not. Many people in America right now still think that they can trust these large gospel coalition organizations, but they can no longer be trusted. The reason why Jesus warned us about wolves who will twist the truth is truth is taken and wordsmithed ever so carefully so that you buy into the lie without ever realizing that it's a lie. And welcome back. That was actually a little sound clip from a forthcoming film, Enemies Within the Church. I don't believe that's out yet. That's a trailer for a film that's coming out eventually, and we'll talk about it when it does come out, Enemies Within the Church. Those we've trusted, they're caving, caving to all sorts of things. Let me just quickly say, by way of announcement, that there is a prophecy conference coming up you need to know about. It is June 20th, 29th, 30th, near Palm Springs, Indian Wells, California. Pastor Tom Hughes putting on Hope for Our Times. 16 speakers. I'll be there. Pastor Barry Stagner, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Dave Reagan, Ed Heinsohn, Don Stewart, Pastor Billy Crone. At least 16 speakers will be there June 20th, 29th, 30th. Hopeforourtimes.com, hopeforourtimes.com. I'll be there hoping to meet some of you who I'm told will be coming from far and wide. Here's a phone number if you'd like to call. Please write it down, 951-708-1407, 951-708-1407. It's going to be held at the Hyatt Regency Resort in Indian Wells, California. It will be live streamed. And after the event, either DVDs or downloading will be available. June 28th, 29th, 30th, sponsored by 412 Church, Pastor Tom Hughes. I'll give a couple of other announcements later. So let me reset the stage by saying that I'm spending the hour with Pastor Barry Stagner. You can learn more at his church, Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. That's cctustin.org cctustin.org. And I happened to share a platform with him about a month ago in Toronto, Canada. Prophecy Conference, Amir Sarfati and Behold Israel put it on. Jack Hibbs was with us as well. We had 2,000 in attendance. Thank you for praying, by the way, my audience. I really appreciated it. These conferences are grueling and uh, very enjoyable. I love to do it, but uh, wearing, let's just put it that way. So we appreciate the prayer that goes behind all of these events. Pastor Barry Stagner was there, and I'm playing off of his message of that particular conference, and it happened to be on the deception, defection, and things going haywire in the church. Pastor Barry Stagner, here's the thing. I think when you introduced your topic, in that prophecy conference in Canada, some thought, what has this got to do with eschatology, with end times? It's not on the rapture. It's not on the second coming. It's not on the tribulation, the antichrist. But you and I know it is about the lateness of the hour. Why don't you explain why you even gave this message? Well, Jan, I think the first thing to point out is in the longest answer Jesus gave to any question in Scripture the Olivet Discourse was in response to an inquiry made by the two sets of fishermen brothers among his apostles, and that being uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and they asked about the signs of his coming. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that Jesus said in his reply was to take heed that no one deceives you. Now that implies an age of deception. They frame the question based on what's going to happen prior to your return. Jesus tells them to take heed or pay attention that no one deceives you. And then the first indication of the nearness of his return was those who would come in his name saying, I am the Christ. And actually in the Greek, it would just say, I am Christ, or I am anointed, Christ being the word for, uh, meaning rather anointed or anointing. So in essence, what Jesus was saying, here's the first sign of the nearness of my return, and that is those who come in my name saying they have an anointing from me. And boy, if that's not something that's going on today, we have those who are claiming to be Old Testament-type prophets, mm -hmm. those who are claiming to be apostles in the likeness of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, which by definition means, according to the Apostle Paul, 
that they have seen the Lord Jesus in resurrected form. So we are seeing many come today using the name of Jesus, claiming an anointing from Jesus as the first indication of the nearness of his return. And then you pair that with what Paul warned about the falling away, or the Greek word hephostasia, meaning to defect from the truth. So you have those who are claiming an anointing who are actually defecting from the truths that were well established in Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, known as the Apostles' Doctrine. This is what makes the link with the last days immediately, because that was the question that was posed by the Apostles. They weren't asking, what's going to happen down through the ages, or how is the church going to progress throughout time and the seasons of history? They said, what's the signs of your return? First thing Jesus says, false anointings. Yeah, you're right. Having said that, and having made that clarification, and again, we opened the programming, we started talking about the typical church model today, at least since the 1990s. You call it church growth, seeker-sensitive, megachurch movement, goes by many different names, usually will involve a watering down of the gospel. Suddenly, people find they're without a church. As one person said to me, my church has left the building. They come to me and they say, what can I do? And they say, I've visited every potential church church in my area, in my town sometimes, one will say, I'm driving an hour one way every Sunday because I have found a church, but it took me a year, two, three, four, five years to find it. What do you say, you as a pastor who gets it, what do you tell people? That's a tough one, Jan, because one, we know that there is a responsibility of the congregant to a congregation. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 was saying, hey, one part of the body can't say to another, I have no need of you, because there are all contributing to the function of the whole, you know, I think one of the tendencies today, and thank the Lord we have YouTube and sound teaching via different internet options, but the reality is Hebrews tells us, especially Hebrews 10.25, as we see the day approaching, the day of the Lord, as we see the day approaching, not to forsake the fellowshipping together with one another, as is the custom of some. Here's why I think this is important to point out, John, because one, if we understand, I think, what Dr. J. Vernon McGee said and said quite well, that we need to remember that the church isn't for us. We are for the church. We need to make sure that we are incorporating acts of service and making sure we're doing our part and seeking the advancement of the kingdom. And sometimes that's going to be maybe in a less than perfect situation as far as a church setting goes. But when we recognize that there are people who approach the teaching of Scripture differently, we need to draw the line between those who are heretical and those who are just downright marketing a product, maybe recognize, you know what, I can't find exactly what I'm looking for. I've looked high and low, but this guy's at least giving it a shot. He's doing what he feels the Lord has called him to do. And put your hand to the plow and make sure that you are serving the Lord and as being part of the church. But again, I want to send out to the listener a word of caution to be the Berean, do the work that we're called to do. And sadly, Jan, I hear what you just said constantly and continually from people who move through job or yeah. school opportunity or whatever away from a Bible teaching church and say, I just can't find one. So really, you have to come down to the place where it's like, you know what, I need to be serving the Lord. I need to be participating in ministry using the gifts that God has called me to for the benefit of the church and to supplement the teaching that I'm getting that is scriptural based and not again, not heretical with being a self-feeder. So it is, that's the one thing I hear more than anything else, Jan, is I can't find a line upon line, precept right, upon right. precept, book by book, teaching church. I couldn't even tell you how many times I've heard that. So I don't believe the option is opting out completely and just feeding yourself online because there are other aspects of the church that we need not just to participate in, but to benefit from, and that is the iron sharpening iron and being in fellowship okay. with other believers. I appreciate that clarification. I want to talk about a couple of other theologies that I think are causing things to go haywire. One would be, I think this is the issue of the last, oh, five to ten years, and that would be the social gospel, social justice, and the activities that have been prompted by, let's just say, the religious left. Unfortunately, it's moving into more conservative circles as well. And play a real short clip here, and then I want us to discuss it. As you've done, the least of these you've done to me. So as I read this encyclical on the environment, it hit me Matthew 25 is again at stake because the hungry will get hungrier because of climate change. Pope Francis is the greatest conversation changer in the world today. 
when his host, President Evo Morales, handed him an unusual gift, a wooden hammer and sickle crucifix. It's a classic communism symbol, frequently worn by a Jesuit priest. There is no other leader who can change our thinking, whether we're religious or not. The Bible is pro-slavery, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The devil is not trying to get you to sin, he's just trying to get you to keep the law. Because if he can get you to keep the law, you will sin. Jesus was a Palestinian Jewish rabbi, he was a person of color that was killed by white supremacy. So we're usually making every effort to be on the front lines for racial justice. He began to preach inclusion, that everyone goes to heaven and that there is no hell. We probably got it wrong. Instead of the Bible being the inspired word of God, it's probably just the inspired word of man about God. It doesn't have a very great view of women leading and teaching. We evaluate an economy by how it treats the most vulnerable. Okay, I would call that sort of a potpourri of heresy, that little sound clip. I mean, it's social justice. You heard the green agenda. You heard inclusion, and you heard everyone goes to heaven. You heard some of my bullet points that I said I had started observing somewhere in the 1990s, not mocking and denigrating of so many things, Barry Stagner, that you and I hold very sacred, including eschatology, the introduction of the health and wealth movement, which has been going on here now for probably 40 years. What I want to focus in on for just a few minutes here was this social justice gospel, the religious left. You heard the voice of the arch religious leftist there, Jim Wallace. What you've done to the least of the, oh my, how many times have we heard that? He doesn't even have that right. The least of these are the Jews, I believe. But give me your thoughts on this, Barry. Jan, it's really what we've been talking about the whole program, and that is the world dictating to the yep. church how the church is going to operate as an entity, so to speak. Looking at these things, we see so much, and it's not necessarily, I think the social gospel is almost a misnomer in the sense that it's promoting communism yes, and egalitarianism, mm-hmm. which is basically the mentality of the world today, that everything has to be equal. Everybody has to have the same thing. Nobody has a right to have more money than anybody else, and all things have to be on equal footing. One, I think, when you have this type of mentality, you're disobeying Scripture, because the Bible says quite clearly, and Paul warned about busybodies who don't work at all, yet expect to eat. We look at even the angelic realm and the heavenly realm, there's a hierarchy. I mean, everybody certainly is of equal value to the Lord, but we're all not of equal ability and capability. Some are mentally stronger than others, some are physically stronger than others, and that is so we can function as a society and a culture and some positions are going to be rewarded more than others. Again, because egalitarianism rules the world, it's now made its way into the church, and this is the mentality of the up-and-coming generation, and it's impacted the church, that we simply need to make sure that everybody, and again, like we mentioned earlier with Titus, we are to meet urgent needs. We're to make sure the church is caring for those within the body, and after all, we're told to do good to all, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Really what we're seeing, Jan, is a move away from the primary function of the church, which is to preach the gospel to the world. And now we're approaching the felt needs category. Felt needs. Mm -hmm. And I think the felt needs may have morphed into this social gospel, social justice, probably. Okay, just some other issues that I see going on, in the, and you raised them, and that's why I'm talking about some of the issues that you raised in your message. And folks, if you want to be in touch with Pastor Barry Stagner, do so through his website, cctustin.org. It's Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. He sponsored a prophecy conference first week of January of this year. I was privileged to be out there with a number of other speakers, Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, Barry himself, yours truly, and we had a wonderful time. I think we had about 1,500 folks did we, Barry? We had 1,770 registrations. Almost 1,800 registrations, and they came from all over, met some wonderful people. Okay, let's talk about just a few other theologies that are troubling today, and you raised them, therefore I'm talking about them just to kind of stick with your message that you presented. We've talked extensively here about this seeker, church growth, etc. You brought up something that troubles me enormously, and it's uh, called Dominion Theology. It basically says that given enough time, the church is going to make the world just really perfect. Only then and only then can Jesus Christ return. Now, I got to be honest, I consider this heresy. I really do. And it's in the same camp as post-millennialism. It's really troubling theology because you and I know that there's not enough time. Given trillions of years, the church is not going to make the world perfect. Nonetheless, this has come along. I think it started in the 1940s, perhaps with latter rain. 
and has morphed into this dominion reconstructionism theology that the church has got to take dominion over the world before Jesus Christ can return. You talk about confusing the church, confusing believers when it comes to end time issues. Sadly, out of this movement has morphed something called the New Apostolic Reformation. That's a group of quote-unquote church leaders who have been assigned the task by the Lord himself, at least according to their claims, Mm -hmm. to usher in the church dominion over all things economic, government, and spiritual, obviously, in order to prepare the world for the return of Jesus Christ. As we mentioned earlier, an apostle is one who has seen the Lord in resurrected form. And therefore, they make the claim to have either been transported to heaven or Christ basically coming off of the throne as he's seated next to the Father and visiting them on earth in the same form that he met with his other apostles and thus qualifying this group to usher in this utopian age that uh, puts the world in such a state that the Lord can return. Again, Jan, I think, as you pointed out, I think we could well label this heresy because you can't back this with Scripture. No. There's nothing in Scripture that says there's going to be this golden era until the Lord returns. It's not going to cause his return, but he's going to usher in that era when the Prince of Peace sits on David's throne and rules from Jerusalem for a thousand years. But we do not have indications in Scripture where there's going to be a second group of apostles spanning some 2,000 years between the last group that was anointed and appointed by Jesus. There's nothing in Scripture that says such a group is going to arise in the last days. As a matter of fact, in the last days, Jesus himself said they're going to be more like the days of Noah. Thoughts and intents of man's heart is only evil continually. The world is filled with violence. And the other thing I think we can't overlook regarding the days of Noah is that Noah built a ship on dry land for 120 years, and he's labeled as a preacher of righteousness. So that tells us he was preaching while he worked, and no one would heed his message And when the flood came, and as I mentioned in the message, Ken Ham has calculated that because of the lifespan during the Noahic period and the near genetic perfection, there were most likely over 16 billion people on the face of the earth at the time of the flood, and yet only eight got on the ark. Jesus said, and it's not a numerical comparison, but it is a likeness to the mentality of the world. Jesus said, that's what it's going to be like when I'm coming back. There'll be relatively few who will heed the message of the gospel. That's exactly the opposite of what the New Apostolic Reformation is purporting to do. I think this also gives us reason to understand why what we have in the church today, and I use the word remnant, there's a remnant of true believers. Because again, you fellows, you preachers, you're preaching your heart out, but so many people do not have ears to hear. Now, again, this is an end time phenomenon. And again, this goes back to people not giving heed to sound doctrine, etc. As the illustration you've just given, Noah preached his heart out with billions of people on the earth and only eight, and they were his own family, responded. And the final generation is compared to that. Yes, and that's why I think, Jan, the people that are uh, sitting in a pew have the responsibility to see if these things were so. These kinds of teachings are easily dismissed simply because they are inconsistent with Scripture, and certainly they are inconsistent with the eschatology that we're given concerning the last days. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse. Jesus gave a progression in what I like to call the preamble to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 3-8, where he gave a series of just general course of life events. There's always been wars, there's always been rumors of wars, there's always been famine, there's always been disease or pestilence, and there's always been earthquakes. But then he uses a phrase that he associates them in answer to the disciples' questions with the last days, where he said these are the beginning of sorrows, which that phrase can be translated as the birth pangs. So he is telling us that there's going to be a dramatic and relatively short spans of time increase in these normal course of life events, the wars and rumors of wars and disease and the other things. And that is what we're seeing today happening in our world. It's not that things are getting better and better. It's not that the church is having dominion over the world. It's just the opposite. The world is growing in its hatred of the church. And as Jesus said, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. We're seeing that manifested today in ways and in a relatively short span of time, especially here in our country, things have escalated in that regard where the church now is looked at with disdain rather Mm. than the respect that we all saw growing up in this country myself. The streets used to be deserted on Sunday, and people were in church, and people who didn't go to church had respect for the people who did. But now 
that's all gone. Things have turned around in a dramatic fashion in a rather short span of time. I would even go as far to say within a single generation. Yes, within a single generation. But I think the point you and I are making is that something changed in the heavenlies in 1948. Obviously, Israel became a nation. That was the most astounding geopolitical event in history, I think. It was a miracle of God, as we all know. But I think something changed in the church about the same time. And then as we moved further into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 80s, 90s, some of these things that we're talking about intensified the things that have gone haywire in the church, including folks not being able to find a church, but including, again, the dropping of Bible prophecy, which, again, I get daily emails because that's broken the hearts of so many people. The war, on I'm using that word intentionally, the war on the pre-trib rapture, which I'm sure you hear plenty about, that's relatively new. I can remember 30 years ago, even when I was growing up in the church, there was no controversy on the timing of the rapture. There simply wasn't. And I'm going to talk about this extensively next week, folks, so I don't want to dwell on it here. But again, Barry, the war on the pre-trib rapture is relatively new when it's such a passionate debate now. It is. And Jan, if I could, if you'll bear with me for a moment. I did a message on the rapture. And if some of your listeners would like to listen to it, I have a YouTube channel called The Truth About God. Yes. There's a message on there called Rapture, Human Invention or Biblical Doctrine. And actually what it is, is it's an apologetic on the rapture. And we use three criteria to establish the rapture as a biblical doctrine. We use Old Testament precedent. And we ask the question, do we find in the Old Testament the supernatural translation of living human beings into the eternal realm? And of course, we do have those quite clearly in the Old Testament who were translated by God into the eternal realm. And then we've got New Testament clarity that, of course, the New Testament is full of references to the rapture. And then we also have prophetic necessity. So again, it's a defense of the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture specifically, and it addresses rather briefly why the mid and the pre-wrath and post-trip positions aren't scripturally sustainable. Right. And my point is that the debate has gotten so contentious. I think it's one thing to indeed have a debate. The producer of my radio program sitting in the studio with me not far away is the son-in-law of Dr. Walter Martin. And they tell the story, Kevin and his wife tell the story of Walter Martin and Hal Lindsey debating rapture timing. They would debate, they would discuss, they'd finish, they'd hug each other, they'd go out for dinner. All right, today we don't get along very well, is my only point. And that's very true. And sadly, Jan, on matters of interpretation, there are those who hold to the school of, if you don't see things my way, yeah. then you need to get run over by the bus. Exactly. Earlier, you know, it's that old adage to the Walter Martinism, we need to agree to disagree agreeably. Mm-hmm. That, too, has flown out the window. So has proving we're his disciples by the love we show for one another. Right. Your YouTube channel is The Truth About God, correct? The Truth About God? The Truth About God, yes. And the title of your rapture message is? Rapture, Biblical Doctrine or Human Invention. Look it up, folks. You can learn so much on some of these YouTube channels and the various teachings. Barry, I'm down to literally, I got about a minute left. If you want to wrap it up, go ahead. It's all yours. Thank you, Jan. It's been a real privilege to be on with you. I just want to encourage your audience that we are living in the last days. The signs are all around us. And not to fall into the category of the Pharisees that Jesus rebuked in Matthew 16 for not discerning the signs. He said, you guys can predict the weather, but you didn't know it was time for me to come. And you didn't know that I was fulfilling scripture concerning these things. So one, I think when we're hearing things about unhitching from the Old Testament, we need to be careful of such things because there are many unfulfilled prophecies related to the last days and specifically Israel that are in the Old Testament. So we need to be diligent. We need to teach and heed the whole counsel of God, all the New Testaments alike, because as has been well said, the new is hidden in the old and the old is revealed in the new. And it's very, very true that we can see more clearly that we are in the last days if we pair the two together and study the Old Testament and see the things that are happening in the church and in Israel between those two and know that it's time to look up for our redemption is nigh. Jesus is coming soon, and that's about the most exciting and comforting message that we can offer to the world today. Absolutely. Keep Pastor Barry Stagner in prayer. I know he's traveling, I believe, to Australia this summer. He's going to be ministering with Amir Sarfati and some prophecy conferences there. Keep him in prayer for strength and clarity of mind. And folks, if the topic of deception in the church interests you, we still carry Terry James' book, Deceivers, Exposing Evil Seducers and Their Last 
day's deception. I have a chapter in this book, as do a number of other authors. We highly recommend We've carried it for, I think, a year and a half now. There are at least a dozen to 15 authors, deceivers, exposing evil seducers and their last day's deception. Find it in my store, olivetreeviews.org. Call my office or find it in my various newsletters, e and print newsletter. Let me go out of the program, and I'm quoting Barry Stagner. He says, when the church begins to be trampled underfoot by men because it has lost its preserving and purifying influence by adopting the doctrines of demons in the form of ear-tickling fables, I submit to you that the remnant church will be taken out of the world in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, and that is the wonderful news. And this message is part of the prophetic scenario that tells us our redemption is near. I want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.